The Seven Economic Pillars of the Economic Freedom Fighters. That is the title of a report written for the Institute for Race Relations. The author of that report, Ivo Fechter, is with us now. Welcome, Ivo. Thank you very much. May we talk about how achievable these policies are? Starting with number one, expropriation of land without compensation. All right. This uh, this is really where we where we differ. I mean, the, let me just introduce quickly why I did the report. Um, it was I was a bit concerned with the sort of one dimensional analysis that you often get of the EFF. You know, um, people like myself, I'm a classical liberal. Institute of Race Relations is a classical liberal think tank. Um, the DA is largely classical liberal, and I suppose so is Biznich, from an editorial the outlook. We often just say, look, they're a bunch of socialists. They're, you know, they're, they're fascists, um, and that's it, you know, which is very one sided, very uh, one dimensional. And of course, the predicted response is that, well, you are just a bunch of capitalists and racists and you know, that's not to me an intellectual discussion. So I came across this document of 5,000 words or so that explains the seven pillars um, in considerable detail. And I thought, well, let me actually just analyze that and look into in detail why um, why these, these policies are either bad policies or why they are good ideals, and some of them are, uh, but the way that they go about trying to achieve them is completely wrong um, and won't work. Uh, let's start with, you know, the first one is, is expropriation. You know, they, they want, um, the first pillar is, is uh, land expropriation without compensation. And by this, they mean all land. They want all land in the country, no matter whether it's currently owned by white or black or uh, camp, private companies or uh, trusts. Uh, they want all land to be owned by the state and it'll be leased back to people uh, upon application. So if the government approves of what you want to do with uh, the land, then it will give you a lease of up to 25 years. Um, of course, expropriation without compensation is not only unjust on the face of it. Um, it would be just only in cases where, uh, where, where you know, the land has been illegally acquired. Um, you know, so restitution is, is is a reasonable. You can make a reasonable case for restitution, uh, but not for wholesale uh, redistribution. That would be unjust. Um, the financial sector would be uh, a major victim of this. Um, they have a great deal of debt secured by private property, um, basically turning those assets or, or um, destroying those assets, which is exactly what they would do. Uh, would have massive consequences for the financial sector and, and would institute you know, a crisis like the likes of which I can never see. Um, so now the government approves the use of the lessee will make of the land. And this basically means that land users will be served to the government. And you can't build a long term business or risk capital on the goodwill of government bureaucrats, um, which is what you would have to do. You would have to rely on the fact that the good bureaucrats would be happy to continue giving you that lease. Um, but it goes further than that because their whole land vision, um, they foresee this agrarian revolution, right? Now, their thought is really very stuck in the mid in the mid 20th century in a way. Um, you know, this is what Mao did in China, Pol Pot did in Cambodia in the mid 70s, and Mugabe in Zimbabwe. They want more than half the population working the land. As they see with more than 50% of the population as small scale farmers. You know, and they think that somehow this is going to um, give you an avenue to prosperity, which is really absurd. If you compare it to developed economies, they got rich by reducing the number of people employed in agriculture um, so that those people could be employed in industry, in commerce, in services, technology, uh, inventing new things. You know, This is where your prosperity comes from. Um, Simply producing food for people to live, you want as few people as possible to be doing that. If you can do that with 2% of your population, which is typical in a developed country, that's great. It leaves 98% of your population to do more productive things. Um, the IRR, by contrast, has a growth uh, policy, um, a growth strategy, uh, which is written by John Indres, its CEO, and uh, was published in August last year, I think. Um, 
It considers secure property rights to be the cornerstone of the revitalized agriculture sector that can employ more people, produce more food, expand into Africa, and increase export earnings. Um, so yeah, that's the, the the whole notion of land expropriation like this is um, it's, it's really dangerous. May we move on to national nationalization, please? Yeah, I could make very similar arguments about that because the EFF wants to nationalize uh, just about everything. Um, and they go so far as to say they want to eliminate tenders. So what they what that would mean is they would have a, a state construction company, for example, a state pharmaceutical company. Um, now, if you really want to eliminate tenders, that means that that state construction company couldn't issue tenders for building materials. So the state would also have to own uh, producers of building materials. You know, they would have to own a brickmaker and a cement company and uh, there'd be a government tiling company, a government roofing company, a government plumbing company, um, electricians company. All of those things, because the EFF doesn't want tenders, they believe tenders to be the source of corruption. So all of that would have to be brought in-house, in government. Um, and essentially, it would extend the state uh, state control over the entire economy. Now, um, Julius Malema, the EFF leader, was heavily influenced by and very admiring of the late revolutionary leader of Venezuela, uh, Hugo Chavez. And he has modeled much of his party's economic ideas on those of, of, of Chavez. So it's really sufficient to demonstrate uh, the catastrophic consequences of Chavismo in Venezuela, where fully three quarters of the country's annual GDP has been destroyed. Um, 20% of its population has fled. Um, nationalization in Venezuela aimed to increase state control and redistribute wealth, which is exactly what the EFF's goals are. But it led to inefficiencies, a decline in productivity and economic instability. Um, the oil industry in Venezuela, its largest source of revenue, was decimated. Production fell by 85%. The ships of Conferi, the country's largest commercial shipping company, are now scrap metal. Um, in 20, uh, uh, 2007, uh, Venezuela produced 479,000 tons of steel. Right. That industry now produces, sorry, last count was 2019, produced 1,000 tons. Right. So it went from almost half a million tons to 1,000 tons in the space of 12 years. The nationalization of agricultural land and fertilizer companies precipitated widespread hunger and starvation and forced people into the kind of hard scrabble subsistence farming that the EFF touts as an agrarian utopia. After taking over the banking industry, Venezuela entered a hyperinflationary spiral. Between 2016 and 2019, according to official central bank figures, annual inflation averaged 53 or 54 million percent. Now, those are numbers that you can't even comprehend. Um, that means that the paycheck you get today will be literally worthless tomorrow. Um, the nationalized gold mining industry fell under the personal control of uh, Nicolas Maduro, who exploited mining, work, mining, mining workers from dawn to dusk under the brutal lash of a state-sponsored network of violent gangs and corrupt soldiers. And the gold buys Maduro a very lavish lifestyle that buys the military's loyalty to Maduro and is one of the few remaining means for Venezuela to buy foreign exchange. Um, similarly, with the large, largest telecommunication company in Venezuela, once they nationalized it, it quadrupled its payroll and raised wages, which sounds exactly like what the EFF wants to do. Uh, but phone lines stopped working. You know, the company slashed its investment in technology, saw many of its skilled staff depart, lost cables and equipment to thieves and looters. If this sounds like ESCOM, then, you know, that's pretty much exactly what's happening, well, what's ha what happened there. Um, they nationalized the electricity company there as well. They suffered widespread blackout, worse than South Africa, sometimes lasting week, weeks at a time. More than 7.3 million people have left Venezuela since 2014, in the last 10 years. And according to the UN High Commission of Refugee, that's the largest exodus in Latin America's recent history and one of the largest displacement crises in the world. This is the model that the EFF would have South Africa follow. I have a, um, let's move on to the next one, building state and government capacity. Yeah, this is the whole thing is really premised on this idea that they can build this grand, cash flush, competent, 
uh, non-corrupt state. Um, they want to greatly expand the size and scope of government. Um, I've already mentioned about the outsourcing, the, the tenders that they want to eliminate, that they want to insource uh, everything. Everything should be done by government employees rather than contracted out to private providers. Um, the thing is, a larger government is not more immune to corruption. Right? It's not more motivated and inspired to deliver high-quality public services efficiently. Um, you know, the private sector is motivated by profit and competition uh, to improve quality and reduce price. Um, the, the, the government is not motivated by profit. Now, of course, the profit motive is anathema to the near future. Um, they think that caring about profit means you don't care about people. Um, they don't see the fact that you have to care about people in order to earn profits. You know, you have to care about your customers. Customers have a choice where to go. If the state provides these things, customers don't have a choice. You know, citizens only can get these things from the state. They're not motivated by profit. So they won't be able to tell whether their in-house solutions are the most effective or the most efficient um, because they would have nothing to benchmark it against. There would be no competition. Um, Experience everywhere around the world, even in the best-run countries, suggests that the service provision of the civil service lags far behind the service provision of the private sector. Um, it talks of a motivated and inspired public service, but what is there to motivate and inspire? It? I mean, you know, in the private sector, you get profit, which inspires people to work hard, minimize mistakes, meet deadlines, satisfy customers. But in the public sector, it's, the paychecks are guaranteed. Um, why would a public servant care about quality of the service they perform. Um, you know, short of getting fired, that's, that's really the only risk that does. Why would they want to innovate to improve the service they perform? So they could check the box, then that's all that matters, really. So motivation really is at the core of the distinction between the public and the private sector. Um, and EFF, you know, proposes that the government should wield dictatorial control over the private sector and establish this fleet of new state-owned enterprises as if the present fleet of state-owned enterprises are not warning enough against doing so. The next policy, providing free education, healthcare, housing, and sanitation. Well, it sounds great in principle. Uh, um, you know, I'm not sure that all of that should be free because ultimately someone has to pay for it. Um, and if you, if you give one person something for free, that means someone else had to work to produce that thing that you're giving away for free. Um, so this is redistributive, but in South Africa, you know, it, we face reality. Uh, there are a lot of people that cannot afford uh, healthcare, education, housing. Um, so in essence, there's nothing really wrong with this this ideal. Um, but we run into the same problem here again. These services are going to be free, but they're also going to be high quality. Now, if they're going to be free, then how are the how is the state going to produce the surplus that they need to produce these high quality services? You know, it's an expensive wish list, um, but they're going to have no means of actually paying for it. Um, and this is this is the this is the problem with these wish lists. There's no reason to believe that an EFF government or any other government will be able to deliver on on the promise of high quality services that are also affordable to the masses. Um, Milton and Rose Friedman once explained how quality and price interact, and I'm taking this briefly through this. Um, you can either spend your own money or you can spend someone else's money. And you can either spend money for your own benefit or you can spend it for the benefit of someone else. So that gives you four possible outcomes. If you spend your own money in yourself, you'll be motivated to maximize quality while minimizing cost. And this is what most of us do when we go shopping. If you spend your own money for someone else's benefit, then quality won't matter so much. But minimizing cost will. Right? Just imagine a landlord making repairs for a tenant, for example. Um, you know, they're very likely to cut costs and not care too much about the quality of the outcome. If you spend someone else's money for your own benefit, well, then you only care about quality, not about cost. You know, a company is going to pay for me to fly somewhere. Well, you know, I might as well fly business class. Sure, you know. Um, if they're going to pay for my lunches, Bring another bottle of wine. Um, someone else pays for them. And finally, if you spend someone else's money for someone else's benefit, you have no incentive to care about either quality or cost. And government falls into this fourth category. 
Um, if we make the government responsible for everything we need, then the government might claim to deliver high quality at a low price, but it is no incentive to follow through on that claim. Um, by contrast, the IRS, the IRS proposal on most of these things is, is a voucher system, where, um, which is a means of subsidizing the poor right, so that they can afford education and healthcare and housing and so on, um, but still maintaining the private sector competition to actually provide these things. So people can decide where they want to spend their money. They can withhold their money and their patronage from companies or schools and so on that do not perform, right? And rather go to companies and, and schools and organizations that do perform. Um, and this this doesn't throw the baby out with the bathwater the way the EFF wants to do. What about massive protected industrial development? Yeah, it's um, this is a favorite, funny enough, of the left and the right. Um, you know, the... the Protection is uh, that they, they they fear imports. Um, they want the state to basically direct industrial planning. Now, the failures of industrial planning, state-led industrial planning, are legion. Um, and in the report, I, I cite um, examples from the Soviet Union, from China, from Brazil, India, Argentina, um, and Sri Lanka. Um, protectionism has been tried many times and found wanting. Um, it dampens trade, makes international trade more expensive, uh, so it raises the prices of goods, uh, of domestic goods. Um, and ultimately, uh, industrial planning on the scale fails because of the economic calculation problem. Um, and this is uh, in 1920, Ludwig von Mises first came up with this idea and published economic calculation in the socialist commonwealth predicting that the socialist state would fail because they wouldn't be able to calculate, um, uh, you know, there would be no, it's, it's impossible for any centralized agent to command all of the dispersed and decentralized knowledge needed to efficiently allocate resources and control production. Um, this knowledge about supply and demand is widely dispersed, which makes it an extremely complex problem, but it's not just a problem of complexity. Um, which ultimately computers might solve, if you think. Um, the problem is it's, it's, uh, this knowledge is also subjective, right? The government cannot know whether you would rather have a television or a holiday. Um, it cannot know whether you would rather have a piece of steak or a vegetable soup. Um, so this makes the problem of calculating and controlling an economy, centrally controlling an economy, totally intractable. Um, the successes that the EFF will point to, like South Korea, Singapore and, and uh, China to some extent, um, they're actually, they relied heavily on opening up markets, permitting free enterprise and attracting private sector investments, which is not what the EFF is proposing to do. Um, all three of these examples succeeded only in as far as they adopted free market capitalism and encouraged the free flow of capital, labor, and trade. So again, we have a, a, a noble ideals that simply... Uh, won't won't work, uh, and 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 will have very negative consequences, um, if executed in a state-led way. That the EFF wants to do, um, and once again, if you look at the IRR's growth strategy, um, you know the IRR stands for free enterprise and open trade. Um, we don't have, uh, you know, the IRR, the IRR doesn't promote race-based affirmative action. They they promote an incentivizing strategy of economic empowerment for the disadvantaged. Um, which doesn't use race as a proxy for disadvantage. Um, so again, if the EFF turned to the IRR's policy, uh, policy proposals, they might actually achieve some of their goals. And what about massive development of the African economy? Well, they want they want Transnet to go and develop the rest of the, the, the rest of Africa, uh, build railways, and do it. And not only build railways, but but I quote: leave massive footprints concerning skills transfer, the development of the communities where investments happen. The payment of tax, reinvest, corporate social investment, safety standards, compliance with labor laws and regulations, and the fundamental economic development of these countries. So, this is almost like colonialism again, um, which is a bit strange for a, a, an organization that is firmly rooted in anti colonial thought, um, and specifically the anti colonial thought of Franz Fanon. Um, but this is the same transit that is broke. You know, it can't even run South Africa's ports and railways. Where the state or transit is going to is going to generate the, the cash surpluses 
to invest in Africa. Um, that's anyone's guess. Um, you know, it's it's investment capital lives in the private sector. You know, it it's uh, it can't be generated by a state that is basically dedicated to producing low cost or free uh, goods for citizens. Um, and besides, Africa doesn't suffer from a lack of investment capital. There's plenty of investment capital to go around. It suffers from self-inflicted constraints imposed by socialism, corruption, and violent conflict. That triple curse, right, socialism, corruption, and war, if that curse can be lifted from the African continent, it would absolutely thrive. Lastly, open, accountable, and corrupt free government. Nobody can argue with that, can they? Oh, absolutely. No one can argue with that. So I was very disappointed when I started reading about what they want to do about this and how they're going to achieve this and find absolutely no proposals. Um, there's no practical way of actually achieving this. Um, they, they do talk about the disclosure of donations to political parties because, well, this was uh, obviously written some time ago. Now, that has already been achieved. That is now law. Uh, but, it, but it revealed nothing shady um, other than that Big business funds the EFF itself. Um, you know, they want to limit political interference in the operation of state entities, and that's laudable. There's a litany of socialist countries, especially in Latin America and Africa, that have degenerated to cesspits of corruption, right, which a small wealthy elite rules over an impoverished population. The more power a government has, the more power there is to corrupt. An EFF government would have all power. It would be a totalitarian state. By concentrating all power in the state, the EFF will create a potential monster against which citizens have no protection. Thank you. That was Ivo Fechter speaking to Biz News about the seven economic pillars of the economic freedom fighters. I'm Christine.